Welcome guys. This is Motivate OTs and my name is Tonga Ichichaya. I'm a senior lecturer in occupational therapy and today I'm really honored to be hosting a very experienced occupational therapist, Professor Emerita Sharon Brintnell. For some of you who might not know, Professor Emerita means retired female professor. Professor Emerita Sharon Brintnell is somebody who really does not require an introduction in the world of occupational therapy. She has been the president of the World Federation of Occupational Therapists and she is also the past president of the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists. She has educated and mentored many, many occupational therapists from across the world, not just Canada. And she has had a really long career. So she has almost 60 years within the occupational therapy career. And in addition, um, when um, she reached her retirement from the University of Alberta in 2018, the University of Alberta actually created uh, the Sharon Brintnell Lectureship Award in Advancing Occupational Therapy. And this is really big, guys. This is fantastic. Okay, so Sharon, thank you so much for making time um, to come to Motivate OTs and have this discussion. I've said a little about you. That's just a little. I know even over the years, you have amassed lots of honors and accolades. I will just allow you to introduce yourself in your own words, and then we'll move on uh, with today's discussion. Thank you, Tanja. It really is a pleasure. I've looked at some of your other interviews and really they're an amazing contribution. I'm a great believer in history and recording it. And I think that your production will serve us well in the future. So thank you for inviting me. Well, I am somewhat of a hybrid. I graduated from the University of Toronto with credentials in physical and occupational therapy. So okay. I used uh, a joint therapist. Someone's idea was that with the human resource shortage that was going on at that time in the 50s, post-war, um, that they could produce a professional that could do OT in the morning and PT in the afternoon in some <laughs> rural areas. Wow. Uh, it's, it's not an idea that went to sleep with the University of Toronto. It, it reappears every now and then by those who are quite ignorant about the two disciplines <laughs> and are shared and quite different perspectives on approaches. Fortunately, it doesn't exist anymore because OT uh, really, uh, during those periods of time, lost a lot of human resources. It's much easier to be a physio when the concrete area of the biological. And when you have a curriculum with biological areas and physical therapy and half and half in OT with the psychiatric and the physical, a new graduate who may not feel confident is going to go into an area where you can see things and do things. And um, it really is then uh, an area that we need to remember but go on for me. So I am one of those. Uh, again, there's a few of us left out there. So from that, I can honestly say I never had a career plan. I am somebody who looks at opportunities and, uh, and challenges and think, well, maybe I could do that. And so my whole career has really been that way. That's probably why uh, uh, my research and my interests are rather eclectic to be positive and maybe right. attention deficit disordered by others. <laughs> I, I cover a lot of areas. My opportunities to be an educator, again, was one of those that came up. I was a clinical instructor at the University of Alberta Hospital, a major teaching hospital, and there was a vacancy across the street in the university. Um, and I took it, and my focus then was in contributing clinical and, and mental health. It was an area before we had the conceptual frameworks. And from then, I 
kind of uh, was in the position where I took on the leadership role. I really didn't want to be chairman. I was looking at <laughs> Uh, my master's degree and in those days too, both in, in many places, they had teaching diplomas in occupational therapy okay. and physical therapy. So if you wanted, you had to have this somewhat, I don't know, it, it, it was an odd credential. And truthfully, I refused to do it because all the courses were at a master's level. And I said, if I'm going to do them, I'm going to get a master's degree. And that kind of set me on the on the course of looking at academia from from the theoretical and from uh, the perspective of, the, of an academician rather than just an educator. And from that, then, you know, I was the first uh, representative to a national board at CAOT, the Canadian Occupational Therapist Organization. Yeah. And then I was um, education chairman, and then I was president elect, and it all kind of tumbled in that way. Um, I'll say it's been a real privilege along the way to have, have served in those positions and have been able to contribute in some way. And along those ways, there were some, some monumental developments that maybe we'll get into later. Wow. Wow. And then I ended up with being chairman of the Department of Occupational Therapy at the University of Alberta for 13 years and acting being one year and then into the World Federation. And I have to thank my university for allowing me that time uh, to serve in that capacity because even though I had my full-time job, uh, there are times that I was away, but I, I tried to fit that in certainly uh, electronics and the internet over the, uh, the latter years made it much easier. But before that, it was faxes and some very articulated <laughs> letter writing and surveys. Yeah. So that's how I got there. More my, as I said, through opportunities and, and being a bit of a risk taker, I truly am. <laughs> wow, wow, that, that's really impressive. Th thank you so much for for sharing um, um, your 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 history um, on this on this on this channel and of course with uh, with our audience. Uh, now I'm just going to move to the to my first question and, and my first question is uh, uh, based on the fact that uh, you have vast experience in occupational therapy and vast knowledge, and um, you have been at the helm of the World Federation of Occupational Therapy piece as as the the president of the WA14. Um, I want to, to know from you how you have seen the occupational therapy profession developing over the years until where we are now. Well, what are your reflections about our profession as we, as we know it currently? In, in the whole, in the big picture, I'm very excited. I think that the recognition, I always call us at times the no-name brands. It's, it's a product that everybody needs and that everybody wants, a service, an intervention. Uh, we have a knowledge base that others like to adhere to, but nobody knows who we are. Right. <laughs> no-name brand. Um, and what I see over the last few years is name recognition which is so critical. The other thing that comes to mind here, my whole approach is not one classically from the profession's perspective. I have somewhat of a business mind and I'm at it from an entrepreneurial uh, perspective of, of, of looking at the profession and its skill sets and its knowledge base and what are the areas that it can contribute to and that it isn't. And where are the areas that we're underrepresented? I've always had that view. Um, to use an analogy, it's sort of like real estate. I like a lot of real estate. And I think our holistic perspective of the mind, body, and spirit that arises out of the development. Yeah. No one needs to be reminded that the profession, per se, starts in Canada and the US at the time of World War I. And for the Canadians, they had a badge 
which was a triangle. And it had a, a sun in the back and a hand holding a mallet. And on the edges of that triangle, it was mind, body, and spirit. And right. the translation of the Latin was man through the use of his hands could be healthy. It's somewhat uh, interesting to know that I think this speaks that my, man through the use of occupation can in, improve their mind and health. And I sometimes wonder if she didn't kind of borrow our, our triangular <laughs> But the point there is that both Canada and the U.S. were always university-based. Unlike some of the other areas um, where they became colleges, like in the U.K. and other places, they were under the faculty of medicine. That's very important to know how far we've come from. Uh, from being uh, independent in universities, but in some cases still under the patronage of medicine, both positively and negatively. Um, and when you look at that progression and the autonomy and the independence and the professionalism that has occurred to uh, our own clinical as well as our academic publications and our research, I, I am very excited. That's not to say that in the areas of the world, um, and uh, there's a lot of publications coming out of the Southeast Asia, um, it speaks to the hegemony of medicine and the suppression. And it isn't just OT, it's the rehab. And I've been there. I mean, I've had projects in Indonesia where we started the educational program there. And there were four OTs, and now I believe there are over 1,500 many with doctorates and master's degrees. So yeah. that's an exciting development for me. But getting back to the point, there are still areas where, uh, particularly in physiatry, uh, and their role within medicine and their relationship with WHO, mm -hmm. um, tries to dominate uh, the rehab profession. It's an economic thing. They, they benefit from the referral system. They benefit uh, in their pockets from having that extra step rather than having an autonomous, independent access to occupational therapy. So that's still a challenge in, in the area of, of our own growth and development, but we're not making decisions that are based on what is best for what we can contribute to a health system. Yeah, the, yeah. the other parts of the big picture is, I think, the uh, certainly the degree and what, uh, minimum requirement now, which was something that I I championed in my work with WFOT, that we had to move from allowing diploma programs. Uh, all they do is perpetuate uh, a second class citizen, then I would say nobody wants to pay the tuition for their son and daughter to get a diploma to become someone that not does not have an audience with the health minister or any of the government mechanisms. In order to have that presence and to speak to these things, you need to be a credible, credentialed professional. And that comes with education. And it was just essential that in the programs that were diploma based, that they be elevated to degrees and then be able to offer advanced education. Which leads us, I think, to another development that we are seeing research that is um, contextual to the country. Um, there are many criticisms over colonialism, particularly now, uh, and the effect that it had, but the reality was that the, the introduction of occupational therapy came with uh, usually mobile occupational therapists who came to a country uh, either often in the 50s or the 40s with a spouse <laughs> and, uh, oh, there's no OT here, maybe we should start an OT school. Um, and so that's been our beginning, and we have come so far in that with the developments in education. So those are all very exciting things. The presence of our contributions to the 
WHO is another one uh, because originally it was with uh, the area of, of disability, rehabilitation and disability per se. It's now much broader with contributions across the spectrum. And WHO, of course, is just one agency of the UN. And when we look at uh, some of the other ones in terms of socioeconomic and um, the uh, ILO, those are all areas with productivity and work that we all have a contribution to be in. Yet we, we took the WHO um, activities very seriously, and I think it served as well, but it's not the only thing. The WHO focus uh, in providing health services and directions and support is toward the low and middle income countries. And often the developments in, in the, the, the first world or the high income countries is quite different. And there is no doubt that there is disparity and the need for uh, human rights and occupational justice uh, associated with disability, uh, not only in low and middle, but also in high income. But that does not address all the needs for the people that we see. And so the idea that we are social justice therapists is not one that sits well for me. Nobody pays for social justice. It's a responsibility that we carry with us as a professional in the area of advocacy and enablement. And if you want to be a social justice therapist, then you should be in social work. <laughs> and I find that sometimes in uh, our member states, there is this weighting toward the social justice that does not recognize the significant contributions truly that are happening in the high income countries in terms of advancements in occupational therapy, where we still have quite a presence in the medical system and a very effective one and a very contributory one. Um, I had a course that I do with my own students and through this uh, experience, they develop programs in response to therapy stated needs. So this, uh, it's a story in itself, um, which I will present at WFOT in Paris. The, the roles and the con contributions to service in, in ICU, in uh, uh, the areas of emergency, which are all medical focuses, but what we bring that holistic, integrated, mind body, whole person perspective is so powerful. In fact, there's just a paper right, right now from the Harvard Medical Review yeah. yeah. Spirituality and the power of spirituality, not religion per se, yeah. but the existential awareness. Yeah, maybe to take you back a bit, sorry, sorry, Sharon, to take you back a bit on the, because, I mean, um, I think it's important that um, our audience will be able to get um, the perspectives uh, correctly. Um, when you were discussing social justice, are you, are you saying, um, are you separating occupational justice from social justice, or are you putting them together? And then my second question says, are you saying, as occupational therapists, there is no role in social justice or in occupational justice? None of the above. <laughs> uh, occupational justice is, is a derivative, I believe, of social justice. And there are many inequities around this world. I'm coming at it from the perspective of, as we educate our young people in terms of the roles and, and contributions that they have. One of the things that is a major consideration for them is who is going to pay them? Who is going to give them the job? Where yeah. are they going to work in that environment? And the point is maybe a little flippant that nobody pays for social justice. Sense that 
that is not the focus of our introduction to the stage. We come as occupational therapists. We are exposed in those areas to occupational inequities across a, a variety of areas. And our interventions are to increase the participation to the modalities we have, but remembering that the focus itself, the primary focus is not that of social justice per se. I think it gets swallowed up and recognizing, and I use it as somewhat as a, a disparaging kind of accolade to say nobody pays for that. If you work for an NGO who is uh, directed toward social inequities, where are some occupational therapists can find employment, but often they're volunteering in those areas. So one cannot forget the, the economics that relate to supporting oneself and the, the uh, I think the sacrifices that you make to be educated and th those your family does to realize that this, there is a cost associated with, there's a thing called a salary. Okay, so your, your perspective is that no one pays for social justice, therefore we have, we shouldn't be focusing on that. Or is it that it's an area that needs to be developed so that it is an the area that to be paid can be recognized. It, it is true to me that the primary operative word is advocacy. When you when you go to look at the inequities in social justice, yeah. you advocate for your clients, you, you seek resources that are going to enable them or provide them with resources that they perhaps need in the physical domain or programming they need for education, that advocacy is part of one of the role functions in what we're doing. If you separate that from me, that is the role of the therapist directly with the external environment. And that mm -hmm. comes as an add-on. Right, right. The, the initiative comes through advocacy. And and I think with the advent of some of the high uh, uh, visibility, there some nobody speaks about who's paying you to do that. Now that may seem very crass, but in this day and world, there is a need to be able to fund and people look to these positions and jobs as a way of career mobility mm -hmm. or family advancement. It doesn't matter what profession it is. Families educate their children so yeah. there is a better lifestyle and a better doing. And okay. sometimes we seem to hate that when we talk about what occupational therapists should be doing. Right. Another part of community is there's always a lot of admonition at times that we're not doing this and we're not doing that. Uh, and occupational therapists should. Well, there are usually very real institutional barriers. There are no positions. If there are no positions, you're going to take a job where the positions would sit. Yes. One of them is here. They are still pretty dominant in the health system. You just look around the world and you will see that people are still associated with the health system. Less right. social system or socioeconomic uh, and education, of course, in uh, in uh, inclusive education. So right. the language used is very progressive, but we also have to understand how we get there, who's going to fund us to be there, and yeah. how do we advance not only the, the needs of our clients through advocacy, but how we then promote the profession's being. I mean, I, and I say this from the point of experience. We had, for numbers of years, very few therapists in the community because there were no community positions. And the few that exist paid much less. And wow. in North America, where education is not totally free, students have debt. They can't afford to take a position below market. So again, I am bringing a market force perspective from 
the administrative, I think, and professional development perspective, rather than the knowledge and skill one, which is so common. I mean, there is no doubt that the skill sets and the knowledge are very, very important. We see that in some of the research that's come out surrounding COVID. It's not just the physical fatigue and elements, it's the mental health of long COVID, where we have a major contribution to do. And so right. there's no doubt that occupational therapy at this point is at a very exciting time. Yeah. I want to see it all. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for, for those sentiments. Um, from, from, your, from the time when you, you began responding uh, to my question, you sort of like indicated that occupational therapy is really not known. What, 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 what are your, your views in terms of the occupational therapy profession? Looking at the demographics of people who are within the profession, how inclusive do you consider the profession to be like? And what is it that can be done? Well, I think that's two questions to me. When I say occupational therapy is not known, we still suffer a bit from, are you like physical therapy? When that question gets asked. And right. that relates to the public press. And that relates, that's the brand name on the big screen. That when you say occupational therapy, Oh, do you, do you uh, provide in the workplace? The occupation word, as we've yeah. known for years, is one that gets interpreted. So it's at that global brand level that I want, I want it to be name recognition. Oh, you are the people that. Yeah. I don't want to answer the question about what is it. And we still, that's because we, we do very badly in speaking to the public press. We, we do not use news headlines. We don't get out there on the radio and on the TV. And our professional organizations play a part in this. They've done this. But it's also every therapist making sure with every client that they see in their families that they understand what it is we're doing and who we are. Right. That's the one part of, of the brand recognition mm -hmm. that is still, I think, a little lacking. Right. How about the aspect of um, how the profession, how inclusive the profession is? Because, I mean, typically or predominantly, it's the white middle class female who is in the you know, I think over time, that has been part of uh, something that has not only uh, been in occupational therapy, it's been in a lot of the allied health professions or the health professions, be it physical therapy or, or, or occupational therapy, even nursing. It, it was female phenomenon. And I, I am never comfortable with saying we've got a problem when you don't look at the bigger perspective mm -hmm. of saying those professions attracted women because of the altruism on the helping perspective. We did research here in Alberta on the profiles of occupational therapists, their values, and we are very altruistic. At, in this time, it was in the so, 80s. So do you consider this to be to be okay? Uh, apart, apart from that, I'm also looking at, I mean, me being a um, person coming from, uh, from Africa or the global south, I also know that the uptake of the profession is not as much. Um, do, do you consider this to be, to be okay, or is there anything that can be done about it? I, I think diversity is something we've all worked on, but I, what I get at, I don't think that this has been some purposeful event or mm -hmm. lack. It's been the way yeah. that the structure of the social structure of each, why did you choose occupational yeah. therapy? How did you learn about that? And it's your exposure either to people in your families or, or services. And if you're impoverished or in a low area, you don't see those things. Yeah. We only see the classic doctor, lawyer, uh, and teacher, and a nurse. Mm -hmm. So I don't blame. I say that part of that recognition comes with the fact of exposure. And certainly there has been a lot of work done with broadening the base. Uh, now, as a female, when you say we need more men in the profession, I'm going to say why. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> 
there are men we treat, of course, we need others, but we have also, let's remember our history. When mm -hmm. men have entered our profession, their career advancements have been frequently catapulted beyond we, women with equal experience. A, they usually don't have dual roles of family. They mm -hmm. often are given the prestige of the position. So there's been a certain amount of, of I think, support through the mechanism mm -hmm. that have really been the ones that have suppressed females. And so we, we have to look at the broad base mm -hmm. of uh, female development and the uh, and career advancement. We're still speaking about the glass ceiling in some areas. So can't put occupational therapy excluded from these other events. So yes, greater diversity across all areas. And the fact that we have educational programs in mm -hmm. more countries now means that that base will expand and yeah. opportunities to a broader socioeconomic and ethnic group will be available. Yeah, but thank you so much for, for those sentiments. I am just keen to know, after having done all this work that you've been doing with the WFOT as, as the, the past president, do you have any, any regrets at all in terms of the decisions that you were making? Um, I think at times that the personal, I, I had some agendas. And for me, the biggest d disappointment was in mental health. We had quite an initiative in mental health um, that arose out of work originally done by Lena Hagman, Dr. Lena Hagman in um, uh, Sweden, when she uh, did a survey on the therapist's mental health. That was published in the bulletin, um, which, which I contributed to, but it originally it was Lena's work. And that gave, gave birth to the human resource survey that the WFOT uh, now runs every two years that is a powerful tool for us with WHO. But it began with a mental health one. I began an initiative and there was a group of therapists under Dagmar Sorgis who ran a, a project to write a document that I feel badly about that never got published or, or aired because of other events that were going on. So that is a regret that they did that work um, and it wasn't fully, uh, 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 I think, uh, provided to the, to the council. Um, we worked with WHO to get our focus beyond physical rehabilitation and disability into mental health. Uh, I met many times there that has now progressed more, but I guess I am disappointed that maybe I wasn't more forceful or more assertive in um, pushing that profile. Because when you are there, you speak to the leadership and you have an opportunity. We, we did and have made great progress in our role, but W. HO is not our only being. Each country, each organization, each professional group, and they've been very successful, I think, in areas in Europe. And uh, I think um, Nils Eric has been terrific with everyday rehabilitation in Norway and the work that he's done, as well as the other Scandinavian and Mona Edwin and her research. There's just some ex uh, exceptional people who continue to do the hard work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the exciting part about yeah. it. That's the part that I think is so uh, important for us yeah. to recognize. The, the part that I think that is a, a mixed emotion, the development of occupational science has served us well to promote the understanding of occupation. But in some cases, I believe that it has been a tool for occupational therapists, researchers, and educators looking for academic legitimacy. <laughs> and by that, I mean they're, they're chasing occupational science issues and not researching occupational therapy. 
So, so what's your what's your recommendation? Not to do with intervention. It is to do with occupation as it is a part of everyone's life and understanding the dynamics and the forces that go with that. Occupational therapy speaks to the intervention and the so, so, to change. Sorry, sorry to jump in there. So what's your what's your recommendation to occupational scientists? Well, I think <laughs> they're occupational therapists, and I would hope that they are equally doing research. Yeah, to a good extent, they are it is the efficacy of our of our our interventions that puts us in demand that we do make change, that people participate more and are more engaged in their life holistically. I mean, I've seen some. I do a lot of reviews for journals, and I'm seeing some very interesting papers coming through with meaningful activity with people in, in, uh, with severe disabilities. So meaningful, purposeful life while living with these very terminal, in some cases, or severely uh, inhibiting uh, diagnostic categories. Okay, I, I see my, my time is running, so I, I think I just need to move on to the next question. So my, 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 thank you for that. My next question is, how do you see the future of occupational therapy? Is it a future that you want to see? And if not, what is it that we can do to achieve the future that you want to see? I think from the base of what, we, what, what we've spoken about today and an exciting development, I think there is no doubt particularly with some of the, 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 say, the research that's come out and the effects of using the occupation now, that it is very, very exciting and advancing. We, we still have a very high demand with all our programs for, for students. There are people that do understand it, but I think we, we are not as active in areas of social intervention, and certainly our, our colleagues and in South America have done that, and, and that, but that is still an intervention and it's still occupational therapy, perhaps more in the broader context of occupational justice and participation. So income generation has always been a thought for people with disabilities. Now we're looking at people who are socially, to the social determinants of health, been limited in their abilities to maximize their potential. And there, the same strategies and works and knowledge is, are equally as potent and we need to expand. School systems is, is again, we've had a, a, a presence in some countries in inclusive education. Uh, we're looking at it a little differently now without the seclusion, but the integration. Um, so there is another domain. And as we move into these social and educational ones, I still think there are major areas within the health system that we can still and do participate when you look at the numbers. Right. Are there so any exciting? Right. Big, big horizon. <laughs> Thank you for that. Do you think there are any sort of like factors that could hinder the realization of the expected future? Um, for us as a profession, are there any skeletons in the in the closet for, for us within occupational therapy? Well, I, I, I think the, the skeletons, uh, as you say, is that perhaps uh, there are some areas where we have not been as inclusive as we should be um, and not promoted. Uh, one of our needs uh, often is to find scholarships for advanced education for people in the low and, and, and uh, uh, middle income, but their, their educational programs are really what need to have the support. And those um, uh, agreements and, and relationships with uh, research-based universities and occupational therapies and partnerships as we did in Indonesia, so that they develop their own academicians who at the doctorate level, who are then much more culturally and and ethnically uh, in touch with the kinds of needs of their clients and the cultural aspects on, on the social demands 
of the therapist and the client. Um, I learned that by being there. And wow, wow. I like that. You learned that by being there. That, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, now, my, my last one, I know you've already addressed um, a lot of things um, around what could be done within the profession, aspects to look at. I just want to give you an opportunity to say, if an OT student is listening to you when they come across this, this, uh, this video, an OT student or somebody who wants to become an OT, who wants to train as an OT, if you are to be speaking to them, what are you going to tell them? Any words of inspiration or motivation for them to pursue this profession? Well, first of all, it's a very excellent choice for education. And I think that's what we're doing. We're educating a whole new crop of, of people. They should seek out mentors. They should reach out to people who they see identified as being with the profession and not to be bashful. Uh, there's no doubt that the educational programs available to them have wonderful people, but they should reach further afield. I, I get emails from not only occupational therapists, but uh, from other, other disciplines who are looking at some of the work I've done, one being with fetal alcohol spectrum disordered adults in jail. I just had a, a request. And the, the thing is to seek out a mentor, uh, to be able to follow the area and, and to be academically rigorous. I think that is the critical need. Yeah. You can't, the apprentice model is still there and some people are hands-on learners, but they still need that theory conceptual background to be able to use the language and knowledge to communicate with others. Advancement is usually not predicated on the discipline itself, it is with the relationships with power brokers and leadership. One of the things that we really talk about often is leadership, and that is promoting it. The other thing is to recognize within our students that they come with very interesting backgrounds, particularly the ones that we see at the master's level entry. It isn't everything they get in the educational program. And I don't like using the word training. We train our pets. We train in skill sets, but we educate individuals because that takes on the perspective of reasoning and clinical uh, and in, in theoretical premises and an advancement for knowledge gaining. So it, it is a strong education to get as much as you can, but to, to use that exposure to the clinical or the field work and to see people in the sites where they're actually offering intervention. That knowledge set gained from observation and from hands-on learning is very powerful. Wow. Seek people out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sharon, for, for your ideas. And I'm sure our audience will appreciate that. I just want to say I'm sure there are or will be a few who will not agree with me. But uh, I think the other part is we have to look more deeply at the language we're using and what we're advocating. So I'm, I'm welcome to any discussion that arises out of this. Yeah, no, no that's fine. That, that's fine. I mean, that's why this channel is there to promote the discourse. Um, we don't expect that everybody agrees with everybody. So we'll all come with our unique views on the same issues, but different perspectives, which is all healthy, I believe, uh, within our profession. So thank you so much. Um, You're doing a marvelous job in promoting. So I'm hoping that your, your YouTube adventure uh, is uh, very successful. Thank you so much not only occupational therapists, but people from other disciplines. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very true. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that. There we go, guys. We have been discussing with Professor Emerita Sharon Brintnell. Um, 
on her views about our profession, the occupational therapy profession, based on a vast knowledge that uh, spans almost 60 years. And she has had the experience of being the president of the World Federation of Occupational Therapists, president of the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists. And her views are truly valuable and they just enrich the discourse that uh, these um, videos are actually generating across uh, across uh, the world so thank you so much guys if you haven't subscribed to the channel please do subscribe to the channel as some of the content will only be available to the subscribers so thank you so much thank you thank you so much Sharon. okay guys bye, bye. guys all right bye bye